Hey everyone, it's Richard here. Thanks for joining me from Calvin Wazoo. And I got another installment of uh, Frank Zappa, one record at a time, one album at a time, making my way through his enormous catalog. So I am definitely going to be having videos for a while coming out on this. And we're up to release number five, which is Cruising with Ruben and the Jets. So, yes, this is official release number five, and this is the uh, reissue by Zappa Records. You know, the story of Ruben and the Jets on the, on the back there. Um, so, yeah, so this is the Zappa Records release. I'm looking for for an original. They're not necessarily that hard to find, um, just that they're not generally in very good condition. So I'm looking for one that's going to be um, in a nice playable condition. And uh, it's on the Verve label. It's the last album to appear on the Verve label. A lot of stuff was going on at the time that this was being recorded and released. A lot of, a lot of different projects. I mean, it was going on while um, the uh, We're Only In It For The Money was being produced. And then there were many other projects that Frank was involved in. It was released in December 1968. And it kind of surprised people, you know, what... What is this? And it even, he was even kind of, um, you know, poking fun at that, almost instigating that kind of response, you know, with this balloon here on the cover. Is this the Mothers of Invention recording under a different name and a last ditch attempt to get their cruddy music on the radio? So, but it's just got this whole mythos going with it in terms of, you know, talking about the history of Ruben and the Jets. You've got Frank's high school photo here, um, you know, with uh, almost a jelly roll on, on the top there. Um, it was doo-wop. An entire album of doo-wop. And at, when it was uh, first, well, I'm not sure if it was when he was first released, but Frank eventually did describe the album as uh, a lineup of greasy love songs and uh, cretin simplicity. So a lot of people thought when this came out, he was mocking doo-wop and rhythm and blues in general and he wasn't he was fascinated by the style he loved doo-wop and he loved the the four-part harmony vocalizations that sometimes didn't quite work in, in in the way that they still came out so wonderfully and how sometimes uh, and this was more true with uh, rhythm and blues uh, and, and doo-wop of that era of the 50s and early 60s that um, in developing, developing into what became known as soul music was that the, the singers were not always in sync, perfect sync with the rhythm of what the band was doing. So there were these like, almost like anachronisms in the, in the music. Uh, that were kind of jarring at times, but the vocalizations were so um, pure and, and beautiful that you would get wrapped up and not even realize that the singers were singing about sex. You know, it sounded like they were singing about beautiful love and all that, but no, they were singing about sex. So th this was kind of the way... Uh, 
that some information was being transferred to young people of the day um, via popular, popular music. So he was so fascinated by that style, he mastered it. So with many releases, starting off with Freak Out, you know, you are going to find um, at least one or two and possibly more, depending on the album, uh, the, uh, a doo-wop song or uh, something that is more on the rhythm and blues side. And they do sound sometimes like he's mocking it, but he's, he has perfected the style because of his love and infatuation with it. He had hundreds of doo-wop and R&B and R &B albums, you know, by the time the, uh, the mothers were uh, initiated. And um, so he knew the style really well and, and how it had these, what he called, stereotypical motifs and, and repeating. And because he was able to recognize them and, and expose them, he could capitalize on them within his own covers, so to speak, of the style. And so it kind of sounds like, you know, to, to some listeners um, that, it, that he is mocking it, but he isn't. It's, it's a parody for sure. But, um, you know, mocking implies a, a derisive response, you know, to the subject, a person or, you know, the musical genre. Um, and that's not what he was, not what he was doing at all. And it was also, we go back to Zappa's uh, influence from Stravinsky. This was something that Stravinsky was doing at the early 20th century, he was taking, and uh, in possibly at that time in the 50s um, as well, uh, but Stravinsky was taking musical motifs from the post-classical period, you know, the 20th century orchestral music, and taking those motifs that were also considered stereotypical for that style of music that was being written, orchestral music that was being written. And so he was exposing that as well in um, some of the compositions that, that he produced. And in fact, in some of the songs that Zappa produced for Rubin and the Jets, that there are quotes of Stravinsky um, from the Rite of Spring. Um, but as he said, you don't recognize it uh, as the rite of spring because it's being layered into these vocal harmonizations. So, um, and plus when you look at the cover and you see, you know, they're all dogs, uh, you know, and what do dogs do? They howl. Um, so th there was that going on. So yeah, there was a response. People were kind of like, well, what is this? It certainly was a major turn off the path that the mothers appeared at least to be headed. And in the fact that, you know, it was packaged like this as Reuben and the Jets and that as the mothers of invention, it was, you know, I was like, well, what's, what's going on here? Um, but there was, as I mentioned earlier, there was a, a lot going on and in the, you know, Zappa Studios, this was a time that, uh, as I said, he was finishing up. We're only in it for the money. He was also developing and working on Uncle Meat. And then he had these other projects going on with Wild Man Fisher and the GTOs. And um, also, uh, I believe that that was also the time that he was producing um, an early Alice Cooper album. So all, all this stuff is happening kind of at the same time. So there was a lot of thought, um, you know, put into this. And despite the somewhat perplexed response from uh, many music critics and also from listeners, 
when this was released, it was well received by uh, many others. Um, in fact, um, David uh, Hidalgo of uh, Los Lobos had praise for this because um, even with the, you know, especially with the, the description, the bio biographical description of Ruben and the Jets, um, it was communicated at a level and in style of address that was readily recognized by the Latino community. So uh, for Hidalgo, it was like, you know, he's speaking to us um, with things like uh, uh, using nicknames that are used consistently uh, within the Latino community. Um, so it resonated and even to a point where a real Ruben and the Jets group was created after this release by people who had no affiliation uh, with the mothers, although Frank Zappa um, produced that as well. And um, they did, you know, R&B doo-wop uh, style. I believe it was, uh, many of the songs were also sung in Spanish. Um, I've only seen that release of the quote unquote real Ruben and the Jets. I've only seen that once in a record store. Um, in all the record stores I've ever been in, that's I've only seen one. And I didn't buy it. And I bought this one because, kind of because I'm like a completist. So I want to get all Frank's releases. But I didn't really buy it because I was that into it. Because during my 20s and 30s, um, I it didn't quite connect with me. Um, it didn't appeal to me. It was, it was so anachronistic to what was released just before it and what was released right after it. It just was so different. It was okay for the doo-wops, you know, one or two to be on, you know, a release, but a whole album of them, all right? That was, I, I, I just wasn't really that into um, the doo-wop and R&B sound so much uh, at that time in my 20s and 30s. However, now, um, you know, in my 60s, I really enjoy this um, because, and not because of any nostalgia feel to it. It's just I have this greater appreciation for many different styles of music. You know, as we go through our musical education or whatever, you know, there are going to be periods of our listening and exposure to music that are going to be very hyper focused on whatever current thing we're into, you know, at the moment and the circumstances, you know, in, in which we find ourselves. So that kind of wasn't where I, I was in my 20s and 30s. I, like I said, I appreciated it on certain albums in small parts, but yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't going to take it as a, an entire release. And, but now, and, and, Z and Zappa has said that the challenge for people in terms of music is to broaden their sense of music and what music is capable of and what it can do and what you can do with music. And he took that to extremes in, in many, many ways and in many, many different directions. And I did grow up with a very eclectic appreciation for uh, a variety of music. At least I think I was set up for it because when I was a very small child, I would listen to my mother's collection of classical music. 
uh, or I should say orchestral music from all different periods, you know, from the Romantic period, from the Classical period, uh, from the post-classical and neo-modern period. She had many of this around and I listened to it and I was a music student. Um, played the saxophone and began in elementary school and through junior high school and in high school. So again, exposed to a lot of different music. I probably got into jazz more so because, not just because of my playing the saxophone, but also because of Frank Zappa and the things he was doing in terms of jazz fusion and, and jazz and just musically in general. Um, so my appreciation of music was growing and expanding. And he believed that, you know, that really people need to expose themselves to many different styles and, and not necessarily have to like them, but to know the style and its roots, um, which some may say is non-existent with a lot of, or with many new artists, that there is no sense of building uh, you know, there are some artists who you can hear uh, and, and they're good, you know, uh, very modern musical artists, uh, you know, uh, so and very commercial as well. You, you know, someone like Beyonce, for example, but you can hear with her music that she she is it's it's her music, but she is educated in where these styles come from, where in in uh, but whereas others, um, it's it's manufactured music and it has, we we say it lacks soul that it's maybe tinny because it doesn't have any connection to earlier eras in in the development of music. So um, I appreciate so much more now uh, this album. Um, than I did, you know, in my 20s and 30s. And this is another album, too, where there is the remix controversy. Because, again, in the late 80s and into the 90s, Frank decided that he wanted to add bass and drums again to, to bring them uh, more forward, because in the original mix, um, they, they really worked to compress the drums in particular uh, to compress that portion of the recording so that it would come off sounding like it was in a box almost and also lend that sort of garage feel to the music. And also with those mixes, the piano is much, much into the foreground and the guitar, you know, is not. It's, it's in back sometimes you can barely even hear it. So that was done intentionally to create that radio sound and even the recording sound uh, of many of these doo-wop uh, doo bands. And so, yeah, Frank, when they got a hold of the masters, um, also used kind of the same excuse that though they were oxidized and so we need to fix them. And so that's when he got... Um, Terry Basio, or not Terry Basio, Chad Wackerman, and um, uh, Patrick O'Hearn, I believe it was, for bass, you know, to re-record those sessions. And that's what was released on CD, uh, starting in, I think, 1988, and then in the early, in the CDs that were released in the early 90s. They were this remix. A funny, funny thing about this is that there was, um, uh, I think it was Arthur Tripp. Let me check this out here. Um, well, Arthur Dyer Tripp III, he's credited with the lewd pulsating rhythm. Um, what happened is there was somebody else I don't think it was Tripp. It was somebody else who um, 
when they were recording, Zappa wanted him to play the drums the, a certain way. Um, Zappa was a composer. You know, he wrote you notes. He gave you little black dots on pieces of paper, and you you were expected to play the way the dots were on the piece of paper. And this drummer, who was an early mother's drummer, and his name is escaping me right now, um, didn't want to do that. He wanted to kind of, you know, lay down his own style or whatever. And Zappa said, fine, whatever. So then after it was all done, and then that drummer left, um, I know I've talked about him before, and for some reason, I cannot think of his name. Anyway, that's when Tripp was brought in, and Zappa gave him the music and asked him to play over what was already recorded, which is kind of a backwards way of some, you know, of doing recordings to uh, be listening to the music um, that was recorded, the voices and the other instruments, and then you lay the drum track on that. But he wanted it played a certain way, and Tripp played it that way, and then that's what was released. Um, so there was a lot of intention going into the way the record was going to sound at the time it was being recorded. So this thing that Zappa wanted to do in the uh, late 80s and 90s by adding these new bass and drum lines to these older recordings um, annoyed a lot of purists. And he just kind of dismissed them in his condescending tone that he had, you know, saying that, well, these people, they're not really interested in the music, uh, you know, as the music per se. They're more interested in the packaging, etc. Well, you know, Zappa, you know, as, as, as brilliant as he, as he was and as great a musician as he was, he was... He was a stubborn and fixed in his mind about the way to do things, and he wasn't the easiest person to work with. Um, although many people loved working with him because of how, what he did to bring out the best in them. Um, but anyway, um, so he just kind of you know dismissed that whole thing. But it's, it's ironic because of all the effort that went into the original recording to have it sound that way. So the CDs um, that were released are these remixes. If it's on vinyl, even with the Zappa record, the Zappa records, so the original Verve and then the uh, release on the Zappa records. So if it's on vinyl, it's the original mix. It's not that remix stuff that was released on CD um, in the uh, late 80s and into early 90s. I'm not even sure if a pure CD release was ever released. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not certain of that. Um, but if you want the original mix, you want to get the vinyl. And it doesn't matter if it's Verve or if it's Zappa Records. It's the um, original release. So, yeah, there were all these other things that were going on at the time. Um, but, but the songs also, when you look at the titles, you're going to know that some of them were uh, songs that appeared, for example, on earlier, I'll particularly um, Freak Out, um, and also I think one from we're only in it from the money for the money, but yeah, songs like um, "You Didn't Try to Call Me" uh, is on "Freak Out," but this one it's very different. They're all different, uh, not different mixes. They are they're different uh, orchestrations. Um, they're completely different versions. They they could be slowed down. I believe on one of them. It might be Love of My Life, which uh, was one of the very few songs. Many of these songs, because of the complexity of the four-part harmony and etc., 
uh, were never were never performed live. Uh, but Love of My Life was a song that made a resurgence during live shows in the 80s. Uh, and again, it's a little bit different than, you know, the original here, because I think um, in Love of My Life also was on Freak Out, maybe. Um, or maybe it's another song I'm thinking of. Uh, oh, Anyway the Wind Blows. That's, that's one that was on uh, Freak Out. Um, and that's the one I think that on Freak Out, it is in 3-4, but on this album, it's in 4-4. Four, four. I may have it switched up. So, but the, the thing is that they're different. They're not the same versions that are on, on Freak Out or something earlier. But yeah, Love of My Life is, is one that was a concert staple for, for many years. And they're all really quite good, uh, all the songs. I mean, um, even the simplicity of a song like Cheap Thrills. Cheap thrills in the back of my car. Cheap thrills, how fine they are. You know, it's just, I need it, I need it, because it feels so fine. It just, <laughs> again, you know, it's, it, he loved the genre and and mastered it and, and the musicians. Most of them are our mothers, you know, that had been recording with him. Roy Estrada, Jimmy Carl Black, Don Preston, Ian Underwood, uh, Bunk Gardner, Motorhead, Sherwood. They're all making appearances um, on this. Uh, but the whole, and they, you, they had fun, I think, I think. Um, it, it's, it sounds, you know, like they were. Um, although there's, um, there's a song that, uh, well, that's on, we're only in it for the money where I think Roy Estrada uh, screws up the words um, and because he couldn't remember them, but they it stayed on the album. Um, anyway, yeah, that's uh, Cruising with Ruben and the Jets. As I said, this is not necessarily an album I really dug or cared or even bothered to listen to very much at all in my 20s and 30s. But now, this is, I really enjoy it. This is great material, great songs, and a solid record of Zappa doing R&B and doo-wop is a, a great record to have in my collection. I really, really like it. So, you know, hey, what are your thoughts about Ruben and the Jets? You know, leave a comment in the down under and please like and share this video. Um, still waiting for some uh, conversational engagement from my audience. Uh, haven't been getting a lot, but yeah, I know. I just kind of launched this uh, this channel direction with just uh, the last eight weeks. So, um, but well, you know, we'll hope we'll get something. Uh, let me know, like it, subscribe. And as I always say, please remember to always enjoy your music.